Whiskey Jason here. Hi, Whiskey from the viewpoint of an American. This week, I'm doing a virtual tour of the distilleries I should have visited, except I was not allowed into the country due to the cancellation of my flights with COVID-19. So who's my guest today? Hey, Jason, it's James Doherty from the Sleeve League Distillers in Donegal. Very, very good. So I think the whiskey that we basically know is called Silky, right? That's right. Yeah, we have a currently we have a blended uh, a blend of Irish whiskies called the Silky, based on the mermaid legend of the the Donegal coast. Excellent, excellent. Now tell me a little bit about your distillery. How did it happen? Why that place? How long have you actually been in business? Good stuff. Well, I suppose it starts. Um, my parents left this area, Jason. Gosh, way oh. back in the sixties. So. Um, so uh, we, we've kind of come home, blowbacks rather than blow-ins, if you like. <laughs> and, like um, so I grew up in the UK, hence, hence the accent here. I grew up in Guildford, sort of southwest London, and um, kind of did, did a sort of tour of the world, if you like. Did a time in Africa, so I spent some time in Malawi and Zimbabwe, met my wife there, came back and fell into William Grant and Sons um, at, at a time, so what was that, back in the early, uh, late 90s. And um, hey, Tina. Um, the you go Google as well. So, um, hey must, guys, the yeah, uh, CMS sorry, is also there. Yeah, so essentially, we came back from um, Africa, went into William Grant at a time where that company, and it probably still is, is a you know fantastically entrepreneurial time. Yeah. Went into sales in in a uh, looking after Eastern Europe at the time when the Balkans was kind of melting down and kind of wasn't sure what was really going to happen. Russia was an exciting place, pretty dangerous uh, at the time. Um, <laughs> Uh, and worked my way through grants, uh, eventually ended up on the board after sort of 10 years or so, but did a few years in the marketing team, probably learned long enough, was in there long enough to be dangerous probably, <laughs> and um, kind of set in motion a lot of ideas that we could probably do this better ourselves. And I kept coming home to Moira and saying, I reckon we could do this ourselves. Um, and ultimately left grants, joined a little short stint with Sab Miller with um, Peroni out in Asia. Um, and while we were there sort of looking out over the South China Sea, uh, from our apartment, kind of started to build the plans for the distillery as we have it here today. So we came back in 2014, um, Christmas 2014. Business started to get sort of crystallized with, with us as we put the team together in 2015. But really, it was, I suppose, June 2017 was when everything kind of, the, the big team came in. We brought, we brought in two guys, ex Sat Miller as well, um, started to sell Silky much more commercially. And, and then subsequently sort of went into the, to produce gin sort of later in 18. All right, very, very good. Now, um, here someone says, was up there two years ago. Um, do you say Seamus or how would you pronounce his name? Seamus says James actually in, in Irish, yeah. Okay, James, okay, thank you very much. And the cliffs are the most awesome. What I'd like to do now is just share your website very, very briefly, if I may. Yes, and the first sure. thing you see are those cliffs. It's amazing landscape there. All right, and so um, just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stuff. And of course, you have different brands there. And I think I recognize someone. Could you tell me who are those three people? Yeah, so I suppose that's the, that's the core of the sort of founder team, if you like. So that's me on the right, obviously, my wife Moira in the middle there. And, and she does all the gin distilling and vodka distilling. Um, and she's turned herself into, into from a midwife into a, a phenomenal distiller. Wow. And then James Keith is a family friend who's kind of helped us put the finances of the business together. Um, and then a you know, real sort of trusted ally. We've kind of, we wear all the scars together. Um, <laughs> but do, I mean, the Sleeve League Peninsula, those cliffs that you showed at the beginning there, I mean, it's a stunningly beautiful part of the world. Um, those cliffs are three times the height of the cliffs of Moa. Um, and, and it, you know, one time, this I was, was impressed by the cliff of Moa. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's an impressive, an impressive place to, to come and see, and, and was also one of the illicit sort of capitals of distilling in, in, in Ireland, really, but certainly in Donegal. Super. Very, very good. Now, let's go back a step. How did you get involved with whiskey? I mean, well, when you were 16, you stole something from your parents' cabinet, <laughs> or what actually was your conversion to this wonderful, wonderful spirit? Well, uh, do you know what? The, the I suppose what university times was when we first started to dabble a bit in and sort of uh, play with whiskies and try and and everyone was trying to claim a little bit of knowledge by finding something that no one could pronounce. Um, but actually, it was at that time that I. Oh, that's why you picked your distillery name. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. So Schlieve is Schlieve is a mountain in Irish, um, and and a bh is a v sound generally, and league is a. Um, flagstone, so it's the mountain of flagstones. Um, 
But I came back on holiday one on one of those rag weeks. It was we all sort of had to get sponsored to get to the uh, the Atlantic coast as quickly as possible. So I said, well, I might as well go and see my gran. And bizarrely, my gran actually sat down one night with with me and a couple of mates from college and gave me granddad's pochin recipe. And I suppose that might have been the catalyst for it all, really. Um, but I suppose I mean, on from there was the time at Grants. You know, I was very fortunate to get to to play in the warehouse with. Um, David Stewart and uh, and Mike Weber, bless him, who, and and guys like that, and play with the whiskies that were up there. And, and at the time, in about 2000, there was a we had a, what was a, a profit shortfall at Grants at the time, and um, so uh, a guy called uh, Tony Hunt took me aside and said, "Here's a challenge for you," and and he said, "We've got a two million shortfall, and we've got lots of old whiskey. Go figure." Um, and so with a guy called Robert Hill, the two of us set about looking through the old whiskey stocks of Grants and, and kind of unpicking some of the, the, the interesting things that were up there. And at that time we did, um, gosh, in those two years, we launched Glenfiddich Havana Reserve, um, the Glenfiddich 40 year old, the 1937, um, the private vintages. And so we just, I mean, literally we were going around the warehouses, finding barrels that people had forgotten about or um, guys that were 10, 10 barrels that were 30 years old that had been bought by some American soldiers who'd gone off to Vietnam and, and everyone had lost track of them. Yeah. So, you know, we then spent time trying to find these guys. So it was, um, you know, great times. So, and I suppose all of those bits kind of have kind of crystallized to pull the ideas together to where we are today. And did you find the guys? Um, we, we didn't actually. So what we ended up doing was, was putting more whiskey aside um, with their names on it, um, and uh, and then and using some of those whiskies. So, um, so we kept whiskey to a, to an equivalent value in stock. Um, but yeah, I mean the, the guys. I think it was they'd gone off to Vietnam actually. So um, you know it was you never we, know what happened then, right? Yeah, exactly. And and you know you spent we spent so much time trying to chase them down, but never really got anywhere. Okay, very, very good. All right, that's amazing, those stories you could tell here. And um, David Stewart, of course, is Mr. Bavini, right? That's right. And, and, and a sort of wonderfully diffident man. So, so, you know, he's just so unassuming. But I remember sitting with him one day and we were talking about the, um, the fact that they were still marrying blended whiskeys before bottling them and, and, and resting them in the vats. And um, I said to David, you know, but geez, really? You know, can you, you know, can anyone really taste the difference? And he just looked at me quietly over his glasses and said, well, you might not be able to, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> very, very humble, I'm sure, the way he said yeah. it too, though. Oh, no, but <laughs> there's, there's some wonderful guys there. And they've, um, I suppose they made some, they make incredible whiskey still to this day. And, you know, so um, really a real privilege actually getting to work with guys like that. All right, very good. Now, at the moment, you have a gin distillery, correct? That's right. I'm talking to you from the gin distillery at the moment. Um, it's it's wall to wall with cardboard boxes full of plastic bags for sanitizer, plastic bottles for sanitizer. But um, yeah, we have a 500 liter copper pot still here that we make our, our gin and Duleman at the moment. Very good. And but in the future, you want to build a real a real distillery for whiskey. Now tell us the plans there. I know they're a little bit on hold because of the situation, but yeah. So um, yeah. So we're building a. Um, well, a, a two-ton mash um, a whiskey distillery making heavily peated uh, single malt and pot still in a town called Ardara, which is a sort of 15 kilometers from here. Um, we bought a field called, which was used to be the old showground, and we're going to build that distillery there to produce sort of 500,000 LPA um, of, uh, of, of good Irish or good Donegal whiskey. All right, very good. I'll show you some pictures here as well of some artist renderings here of how the distillery should look. That's very, it. Very you can see the, the image in the middle gives you the, the whiskey still house right. um, with the three three big copper pots in the middle there. Right, um, the still. Uh, sorry, yeah, and the right-hand side there with the, the other sort of the smaller building with the stones on it, that's the, that, will be, what, that gin house will house oh, what's currently okay. here. Okay, very good. Yeah. All right, gotcha. Very, very nice. And the name is um, Ardara? Ardra, yeah. So Ardra, Ardra sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in, putting yeah. syllables where they don't belong. That's Gaelish for me, yeah. Well, no, no, don't worry, because there's, uh, there's plenty of Irish words that have letters that don't appear that you have to pronounce. So <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it's actually Ardenraha in, in Irish, which is the height of the fort. So there's a fort up on the hill. 
Mm-hmm. So, um, but it's been anglicized to Ardra. So, um, and then the intention is to produce two, so two styles, single malt and pot still, and then in, and, and then within that, two more styles. So the single malt that would be heavily peated and, and, but sort of perhaps more elegant, and then one called Schlieve League, which will be heavily peated and, and much more sort of robust and challenging. <laughs> challenging, interesting. Now, um, usually Irish whiskey is considered triple distilled and light and filigrin, uh, just just so so gentle. But you want to uh, do something very raw and actually challenging. Why? Well, I, I think um, I suppose there are a number of things that come to it. I think that, that if you look at the sort of the distilling map of Ireland today, everything is, well, not everything, but the majority of it is the sort of south and east of a line drawn from uh, probably Dundalk through to Kerry and everything is south and, and, and east of that. And actually, yeah. if you look at the history of Irish distilling and illicit distilling, it would probably have been all to the north and the west of that. Um, so to me, the, the, the reality of Irish whiskey today is that the flavor is one that's evolved over time as, as the businesses have got bigger, they're all more city based. And so Irish whiskey today is a flavor that is much more city based, I think. And, and if you were on the West Coast, you wouldn't have had, you know, you wouldn't have had coal. So you would have been using peat to dry the barley so, yeah. or to dry your malt. So, so to me, it, all of the whiskies here would have been peated to some degree or other. Um, and that's so we want to recapture that and try and be true to what Donegal would have been. I suppose we're trying to build something that's true to Donegal. Um, you know, even our gin in Andulaman is savory rather than sweet. So it's kind of challenging that code in the same way. So trying to make things that are true to this county uh, rather than necessarily true to the whole country. Very good. So I'm going to have a little map here of, um, of Ireland. So if you take a look at this, actually, you're further north than most of Northern Ireland is. <laughs> you're actually north of Belfast, I think, if I look at that correctly, aren't you? That's it. Just just north of Belfast. If you if you almost head due west of Belfast, and when the road stops, you pretty much come to us. Wow, very very good. I've never been up to that area, so um, that would have been actual. That's why I didn't even have you on my tour, to be honest. Originally, it was a little bit out of my my way there, and that's interesting. Interesting. There's, there's interesting. actually one, Jason, one more distillery going in just north of us, about an hour by drive to drive um, to in a place called Crawley, which is actually where the the band um, oh, okay. you know, from that that area. So they've taken the old doll factory up there and they're building a distillery in there at the moment. Very good. Um, so a few years ago, I was actually in um, Derry. Yes. Um, and I visited then the um, <laughs> almost built or <laughs> distillery yeah. from the quiet man. And then they stopped construction, which was a very, very um, <laughs> disappointing moment in my life. But, yeah. Um, Buckle says um, that style fits actually to, um, to that area and the town. Um, our dad is a lovely place. I think it was a really good idea to move there, even when it wasn't the plan at first. Okay, so Tina knows a little bit more than I do. Yeah, so, so I had a, actually Tina was up recently in the summer last summer, and we had a, a drink with her in Ardra. Uh, actually, Thomas is um, is one of our what we call our muncher. So in Irish, you'd say you talk about our people, yeah. and uh, our muncher. He is. He is. Yep. So he, he is a, a big fan, big supporter. So he's been brilliant. Uh, and we did have a site in the town that we actually live in now, but it ended up with a, a spurious legal battle that just ended up dragging through the courts forever and ever and ever. So you, you, know, you have to make a call and move on. So yep. that's what we've done. Very, very good. So you do have planning permission. And then when could the the construction start? Well, so the, 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 the site is actually alongside a river. Um, and so that we've actually got diggers in the field at the moment doing um, a sort of flood mitigation plan. So just to make sure that if... If the river ever got to a one in a thousand year storm, that it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't. Which happens every ten years at the moment. <laughs> yes. So, um, and and also because of the catchments here, they're actually quite. The rivers are quite peaky, so they tend to flood quickly and then drop quickly. But so we've got the mitigation works ongoing. But that that's just been the government's pulled people off building sites, and uh, <laughs> <they're not. laughs> the. Um, so we've um, so we've pulled the guys off because of the because of the lockdown at the moment, um, and we. We, we were hoping to be distilling at Christmas this year. I think with the time we've lost now, um, Forsyths are currently on lockdown in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be so into... they're building your um, pot stills, Forsyths, yeah. That's right. So, in fact, it's a turnkey for the, for the whole distillery mm. for Forsyths. So, so um, uh, we're looking at... I mean, we've, we've sat down and worked through with them to, to develop a, a distillery based on using all grains in, which is, I think, we probably be the only people in Ireland doing that. 
Um, so Please describe what that means. What does it mean? All grains in? Well, so we're gonna. Uh, so we're using a roller mill at the start, and we're we're making both uh, single Morton pots still, as I said. But we'll be instead of filtering out with a conventional uh, mash tun, we're actually using a, a cooker. So we'll we'll use a mash conversion vessel, um, and we'll keep the grains into the fermenters, uh, and then through the fermenters uh, into the wash still, and then we'll we'll take the, the grains out at that stage in the effluent there. So we leave the grains all the way in. Um, where, you know, it should produce something maybe a little bit a little bit rawer at the start, but it'll be interesting to see how that matures and those kind of secondary flavors that we get in the fermentation with that. Very good. I just talked yesterday with a German distiller who does exactly that same process. So that's why I was thinking, I just heard that the other day. Who was yeah. it? But it was a German guy doing it. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Oh, brilliant. It would be good to actually get, get to talk to him and actually learn some lessons before, before we yeah, get exactly. Hans Jürgen um, Philp, uh, he is his name of his distillery is Sin Gold wow. because, yeah, ah, you might actually know him. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So, um, all right. So it's going to be triple distilled. You're going to do your own um, corn in. That's very, very interesting. Now, um, tell me a little bit about more of the process here. Will you by, be buying only local grains or how do you do that? Because you said grains and not just barley. That's right. So for the for the for the barley, we're we're hoping to get as much as we can from the the Donegal, the East Donegal areas. The soils are much better than they are where we are here, and the farmers are fantastic. There's some brilliant um, organic farmers out there as well. So we're talking to them about using uh, Donegal grain where we can. Um, in the pot still, we're looking at a a 50 30 20 mix. So 50 percent malted barley, 30 percent green barley, and 20 percent oats, which we think is pretty typical of what would have been happening in Donegal. So it so, would not be qualified, classified as pot still. Yeah. It's, because it's, of a dumb technical file, which I'm learning more and more about it recently. Yeah, so it's, it'll, it'll throw up some branding challenges for us in terms of how we tell the story. Um, but uh, I suppose if we can get as creative as the guys at Compass Box, we'll come up with some clever uh, names. Sure. Yeah, John Glazer is just great at that, isn't he? But he's yeah. got a lot of this during the years as well. Well, <laughs> you know, I think it is, um, it, to be fair, I think the, the you know the the GI was the technical file was written at a time probably without some of these things being thought about that you know that it's kind of cemented a position in which is probably not not necessarily traditional so um, I think there's plenty of evidence because all the mash bills were documented by the tax authorities that you can show that it's not reflective of tradition um, but by the same token you probably have to start somewhere with a technical file so let's um, let's let's Get it through the EU finished, and then let's um, and then let's get lobbying for 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 some sort of flex that brings it into line with what tradition would have would have said. Okay. I was talking with John Teeling Monday a week ago, and he actually said, "I never thought anyone wanted to drink pot still." I was actually against it when we did G the geographic indicator, the GI, and so he was like, "I was trying to keep this as close as possible to nothing," and it was like, "No oats ever." Yeah. It was just all this going on and on and on. And it's just like, wow, I did not know about that. And of course, of the big boy back then, uh, Irish distillers just like, nah, we'll do our own thing. Just let, we're, we're Irish whiskey now. Stop, full stop. Yeah, I think, interesting. I think there wasn't that many people at the table that, that would have had a different voice. So if right. you look at the guys that were writing the rules, they were written for a moment in time. And, you know, having been in, been in those kind of big, you know, in a big corporate as well, you kind of know how the, how the, the way the game is played. But I think realistically, it's, it, there's enough errors. It, there's enough reason to, to, to open the debate. Um, and I th and, but I think it's important that we open the debate from within the, the association rather than lob stones at it from the outside. For me, it's, um, it's important that we all kind of do it, keep the collegiate piece that's going at the moment and see how we can bring it forward. Great. Five-year plan, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got five years, so <laughs> exactly. Maybe that's exactly what we need. Yeah. So uh, you know, I'm uh, I, I'm I'm patient, and but uh, you know, we'll deliver it with it. All right. Very good. Talk a little bit about the wood that you plan to use. Is it just all ex bourbon? Do you want to have virgin oak? Do you have any maybe fortified cherries or wines in there? Yeah. So we're looking at uh, at a mix of sort of seventy five percent of the the barrels to be first fill bourbons, if we can. 20% um, of them to be sherry casks, probably Oloroso, uh, um, if we can get them, and then sort of 5% sort of dotted around the specials of interesting things to play with. Um, I mean, I suppose we kind of view um, the, the release policy in terms of how we want to go at it is, is kind of to try and 
create a style from the get-go uh, and we thought about kind of the, the whiskey that the stills will produce and then the barrels that we can use to create the sort of the, 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 the to finish that flavor off and then kind of release that in tiny stages where you kind of lead people with you on an evolving journey of how that flavor develops um, you know whether whether the commercial pressures on the business later kind of allow us to be as kind of idealistic about that I'm not sure but but it you know, for now, we're certainly looking at exactly you know small releases in year three of probably of of pot still. Year four of the single malt. Year five go back to the pot still. Year six go back to the single malt and sort of alternate them like okay. that. And mm -hmm. then hopefully the pot still somewhere between five and eight years is kind of going to be where it's it's kind of ongoing flavor profile is going to be. Um, and then we'll hold back as much single malt as we can. You said a capacity of a half a million liters, or what was it again? Yeah, so it's uh, it's well, it's it's four forty um, four forty LPA on a double okay. ship. Yeah, um, okay. but we've built the the building's got space for for additional fermenters so that we can actually put it into a triple shift if we wanted okay. to. Very good, very good. So it'd go up to six hundred, maybe even then. Yeah. So right. uh, that's that that would be the plan. Yeah. Good. David wrote this in one of the other chats, and I did not show it. So maybe you can help us understand what this means. All right. Yeah. So what do you think of the public health alcohol bill from last year? Well, So what country are we in with this statement, first of all? So U.S., it's Europe? Not, no, it's yeah, I have no idea. That's my problem. <laughs> no, no, it's an Irish initiative. And, um, you know, the government is, is, is trying to legislate to or has legislated to, to bring back, bring control on the abuse of alcohol, underage drinking and, and what have you. And, and to be fair, if you're in a government position, you end up with quite a lot of blunt instruments to deal with. So they've kind of gone at minimum unit pricing. I don't have a particular issue with that. You know, if you're Scotland, dealing, they are exactly the same way. If you're with yeah. premium and super premium products, it's not. That's not a really no. challenge. They're looking at the segregation of the space where alcohol is sold versus that. Again, kind of, it's awkward for small rural areas like we are for retailers, but it's kind of understandable. Yep. Um, but you know, you know, we need to be careful that we don't. I guess sort of disadvantage our own industry against you know the, the rest of Europe or the rest of the world, but you know by the same token, how how do you address kind of abuse of alcohol? You need to make sure you do something, and 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 we need to we as an industry need to be seen to be part of that process for good rather than just sort of standing against it. It's it's how you finesse those things, I think, and how you how you take it forward in a way that achieves the objectives of reducing underage drinking, abuse of alcohol, and what have you. It, to me, it's more of a challenge for some of the kind of below cost selling. Um, you know, that kind of stuff is much more of an issue than it is around, you know, a super premium gin or a super premium whiskey that's out there. So I think, you know, the, the, those aren't the products that are being abused. Um, but it's, it's probably easier to legislate against producers, primary producers, when some of the behaviors you might be not particularly in favor of might be actually to do to, down to retail or, or other channels and not necessarily within our control. That's good. That's good. And uh, Tina said they should be um, should target more cheap alcohol and not things like whiskeys, for example. But all right, good. Now let's move on to your core range, if we may. You have yeah. basically uh, the, the Silky. Yes. But you had a different variation of that as well now. You had batch one and batch two, I thought. Yes. Yeah, so, so, well, I suppose um, Silky's actually on, on a sort of third guise, if oh. you like. There was a guise in, in 2016. We started with Silky with the whiskeys I could get at that time. Um, super easy, super light in, in style, dangerous. Did you say triple or double distilled? It was double distilled, um, okay. but it kind of crept up on you. So it was super elegant in that sense. We upped the malt content um, after about a year to 25%, and that was sort of silky too, if you like. Um, and actually, so the first when, one was maybe 90% grain and 10% malt around. Uh, no, it was 20. So it okay, was 20, and then it moved up to 25. Very good. Yeah, so it went up to 25. And then we, uh, I think actually, on the, because of the advent of, of, of Great Northern West, uh, Great Northern and, and sort of West Cork, and the sort of more availability of different styles allowed us to. To play, I mean, one of the things that the, one of the joys of Silky is that you you don't get to play one instrument; you get to play the whole orchestra. So you get to go and play with 20, 20, 30 different styles of whiskies and put them together. Um, but we elected to actually make a sort of fundamental change. We bring bring the bottling back in house, so we bottle it here at the distillery. In fact, the guys out the back are bottling it right now oh. for, for the U.S. Um, and we took the recipe apart and then kind of came back at it. Um, and so now Silky is forty six percent. It's not chill filtered. 
It's um, a blend of double distilled, uh, double distilled single malt matured in bourbon barrels. 15% um, of it is that. 13% uh, of it is triple distilled single malt matured in sherry casks. 2% of it is peated, triple distilled, peated, heavily peated. Um, and for those kind of guys that know whiskey in Ireland will know Thank that. Thank you, John Teeling, with your great northern distillery. Otherwise, we would not have that at the moment. Uh, matured in sherry casks as well. Uh, and then we have uh, a 70% of grain whiskey, which we actually use rechar casks. Okay. That. And we get a kind of buttery note off that. So that's that's kind of silky as you see it today. Ooh, I've gone the wrong way with the camera. There you go. Yep. Um, and we've just put together, which is probably the whiskey that I always wanted to make in terms of silky, is uh, a dark silky. So okay. we have here a... Um, so the core of the of the blend is is kind of pretty similar. So you start with a 15% double distilled uh, bourbon cask uh, single malt, but then we use 15% heavily peated triple distilled single malt in a sherry cask. So that's what really whacks it up in terms of the smoke, uh, the smoky texture to it. And then we use uh, the 70% grain is actually in virgin oak, which gives us this kind of real dark. So this is uncolored, that's, that's the natural color uh, and non-chill filtered. So it's got a real nice, um, kind of intrinsic sort of silky taste to it, but it's then got this real smoky overlay and it's a smoky overlay rather than that kind of oily peaty um, aroma. And we're trying to, I suppose the inspiration was trying to capture the aroma of my granddad's pipe in the morning, yeah. that kind of dry, dusty, tobacco-y smell. Um, and I think we've kind of done that. Now, I haven't seen that in Europe yet, have I? Is it available? No, so it's not, so it's, it's only literally, we, we were going to launch around St. Patrick's Day and obviously with the, <laughs> With, with our friend at COVID virus, we've, we, we haven't managed to do that. It is available sort of locally here in Donegal. Um, it has gone to Finland, so the Finns have taken some. Uh, wow, we, we have a good uh, distributor, I guess. So we, the guys are doing really well. They loved it. Um, and, and actually, Haramex uh, in Germany uh, have placed an order so that their palette is here. We're loading it. It'll go out okay. on Thursday. So it will be in Germany um, sort of in the next couple of weeks or so. So it's kind of, um, it's, there, it's, it's going to get out there now, you know, quickly. I, I think um, it's probably kind of gives you a sense of where we're going with the, with our distillery and what we'd like to produce. And so, yeah. um, you know, it's it's interesting. I was talking to um, Ivor, you know, Whiskey Talk to You, and, he, you know, he, he was kind of interested in how we've got this sort of smoky overlay. So you've got the core of the blend, and then you've got a smoky overlay on top of it rather than, the sort of very specific peat that you associate with a, a Laphroaig or with a, a Talisker or whatever, where they have quite different and distinct sort of smoky notes. Excellent. Price point? Um, just, uh, just to let you know, we have, uh, so this one's laid down for Christmas. So, uh, so I've got something in barrels up here, but I can't tell you about oh. it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we, you know, I've got, um, We've got barrels dotted all around the place with with things that we're trying just to see see how you know how silky will develop in different types of wood as well so um you know hopefully every year we'll have something new and newsworthy very good very good so kate fox where she where can she buy it in wicklow and will you be using maybe celtic whiskey shop and or irishmalts.com <clears throat> so celtic whiskey for sure irishmalts.com um we just obviously with the, with the lockdown we haven't been down there to, to get it in there. So, so Celtic Whiskey um, will take it. It's in, actually in Dicey's.com right now. So the, the um, wholesaler in Dublin, uh, in Dublin, in Ballyshannon. Um, so Brendan, Brendan has a sort of microbrewery. So when you're over, Jason, we'll have to get you into his tiny 2,000 hectolitre brewery. Um, but his off license is uh, amazing. He had quite a lot of red breast in there wow. the other day. Okay, excellent. He really, excellent. really talked me into collecting one. <laughs> I'm not buying one to open, but to collect one. An interesting yeah, concept but, as well. Uh, yes. Quite a collection. I have a, my pride and joy is I have a 1951 Balvenie sitting at home. So um, that's kind of special. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> very, very, very good. Now, um, oh, look, you're using the right glass, David said as well. Oh, uh, yeah. So, well, you know, the two are glass. So, uh, yeah. Rosie did that, didn't she? Yeah. Rosie. So she's. Um, so, so friends of ours and uh, yeah, so we, we use this. I mean, I, I, I'm, uh, I suppose I like the fact that it's slightly bigger than those, those Glen Cairns, it feels a bit more generous. Um, and it's, the base actually makes for an interesting talking point a lot of the time. So people <laughs> seem to be fixated by the idiosyncratic base on it. Yeah. 
Very, very good. Mm. Yep, I always see Star Wars in our nice little um, Millennium Falcon there. Yeah, the Millennium Falcon, <laughs> or it could be Darth Vader as well in some sense. Yeah, exactly. Uh, All right, very, very good. Now, will you have a visitor center in the future? Will that actually, the distillery, be open for us, the public? Yeah, absolutely. I suppose, I mean, you can do a tour of the gin distillery as it is today, and we have people mm -hmm. come regularly. We can even, um, excuse me, we can set, we can take you down on the shore. I mean, it's a full moon tonight, so you know, we, you know, if we were allowed out, we would be out picking seaweed tomorrow. Um, but uh, you know, so we do tours here as it is. But the whiskey distillery, I mean, I, I suppose our philosophy is that we're a working distillery that you can come and see, rather than here's an all singing, all dancing brand center. Um, so I think you know, we've 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 kind of gone at this in a way that says, um, if you're um, so there's no food. Um, so there is a there's a tour of the a whiskey distillery, a tour of the gin distillery, a tasting bar, a gift shop, as you'd expect. But there's no food, there's no restaurant, there's none of that kind of aspect to it. There's no gin school. Um, our view was that the village of Ardra is on the on the um, uh, is on the Wild Atlantic Way. It's a town that's that's full of kind of interesting things that you can do: hand weaving, you know, knitters, the that kind of all that crafty stuff. And so I have, and but also a lot of great hostelry. So our view was that we shouldn't be hoovering up that that kind of aspect of it so we actually have you coming from a car park bridge over the river into the field where the distillery is so try and get people out and walking through the village and using you know using taking advantage of the great pubs and you know and hotels and restaurants and whatever that are in that in the town rather than let's all go to the distillery and then and then leave it was yeah. how do we get how do we try and just be another part of the of the village where people spend an hour and you know maybe an hour at the tour an hour with the hand weavers and then they need you know coffee or a bed or whatever so um you know that's the that was the thinking anyway all right very very good so i'm going to do something i hate doing but i'm going to look at your web shop and um if i do that actually um so there's one in the uk so the, the irish you know, one you're yeah. actually yeah the fine whiskey sellers but i wanted to use that as a um uh, you do not just have whiskey, you have a vodka and you have also two gins. Do you want to yeah. talk about those for like three minutes, Max? <laughs> hey, no worries. Well, I suppose the, the, the Andulaman gin is a, a savory gin in this world. Which, so we use uh, five seaweeds um, that, that, that give you this big savory kick. And it's been, someone else described it as a love letter to the Donegal coast, which <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to argue with that. Um, the there's there's a, a second variant of it which is the only navy strength gin in ireland which is the santa Ana, aged in rioca barrels if you're a whiskey drinker and you were into that that's probably the one you want to go for it's got that kind of space that kind of aroma and, and get you in there quite nicely um and the vodka was one just trying to capture a moment so we tried to capture the sort of doodleman was capturing that moment on a sea breeze the vodka is capturing a sort of the, the moment in the donegal hills which is dry dusty uh well some, sometimes it's dry. I was going to say, normally not. <laughs> no, but you get that summer moment when in June when you you know it is kind yeah. of uh, it is kind of dry and dusty. And so we collect, we use rowan berries and gorse flowers to create that flavour. Um, and it has a kind of grassy coconut milk type, a coconut water kind of aroma to it. So it's a, a vodka with taste. Um, right. We're trying to do them. I suppose we don't have the luxury of a of an Irish distiller's two hundred years of history. So we have to pr prove that we can do things that are kind of technically quite interesting or clever or, or you know, challenging to make. So that's that's how we come at those. Very good. So if the audience has any questions, please ask. And David has asked the next, next question. Just wondering what impact might have um, Brexit on you? Um, also from the border county distiller here, yeah? Yeah, so I think that's an interesting question. I think we, we're kind of fortunate, I guess, that we're not that big. So um, okay. it doesn't have, it has probably has a much bigger effect on the guys that are much bigger than us. I think from our perspective, we think Brexit will result in sort of lead times lengthening either on getting things in or getting things out. We have, um, we've changed the routing on some of our botanicals. So for the gin, the ones that come in from the UK come in through Belfast now, not through Dublin, because we think that post the Brexit, post sort of next December, that we'll, that, that the North will have a different status. I don't know what that might mean, but it'd probably be preferential, so we'll take it. Um, as for the sort of border county piece, you know, the, just putting a border up is a nightmare. You know, we cross, if I drive to Dublin, uh, to Dublin airport, I cross that border, you know, four times, in and out, in and out kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah, that, 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 those main roads were just built as if there were no border. 
Yes. Yeah, and it, I mean, the genius of, of the Good Friday Agreement was it kind of almost reunited Ireland without telling anyone. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we're all European, it doesn't matter. So it, it's a concern because I think as soon as you put up infrastructure, there's a, that's quite scary. Hmm. So okay. uh, hopefully they see, hopefully the, the politicians have got better brains than me to work this out. Okay, you have a, you're a very optimistic person. Congratulations, yeah. James. I like that. Very, very good. So what have I not asked that you might not want to mention as well before we end this live stream? Um, well, I suppose... Um, as with most distilleries, you could, you know, we all need support all the time. We have, you know, we're, I mean, the biggest challenge for distilleries, I suppose, you've got two challenges. One is making things you can't sell because you don't have a route to market. Yeah. Um, hopefully, having spent 20 years in that, that's that's not our concern. But you know, the, the other thing is you run out of money. So um, you know, we're always we're kind of looking for investors. We've got investment run round sort of going at the moment. It's not a great time to be running, raising money when everyone's hands are deep in their pockets. Um, Sure. But we also have a, a cask scheme called Shanaki. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, Shanaki is a storyteller. Um, and I suppose our argument is you buy a barrel because you want to tell the story of that barrel and, you, and your, your part in our, our building it. So it's not so much an investment, but part of a club that gets you um, to know that you're keeping this company private, you know, keeping it family owned and, and helping deliver a piece of a legacy for the whole of the county, which is um, pretty special. So, um, so we've got those kind of things going on. Um, it's not on your website. Where could I find information about this? Just write yeah, an email or what? It's on the website. It's under Biggie Lynn. So B I G. Oh, okay. See, I need to go there because I did not. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'll go there again. No, so Biggie, Biggie Lynn, Lynn with us. Read it again. Uh, and that gives you the various options on yeah. that. I'll show that as well so we can actually have seen that. And then, um, so here we go. Boom. So if I go back here, you just go basically to, down below to the Biggie Lynn and then you read more. And then down below that, you have your cask ownership club. That's very, awesome. very good. All right. Nice, nice. My rule of thumb is I buy a cask after the distillery starts producing spirit. I'm sorry. I know that's, that's, that's fine. And at the moment, if you if people want to come in, actually, we only take the deposit at the moment because um, we can't actually rec recognize the money in the system, in the business, yeah. until, until it's filled. So for the same reason. So we, we kind of earmark it and earmark the number. Um, mm -hmm. So that people know if they've got a preference for a number 13 or a number 20 or whatever, they can lock it down. Um, and then, uh, but I'm, I'm absolutely, Jason, I, I'm expecting more to be sold when the minute the taps are turned on, as opposed to now when you're kind of selling a dream. Yes, exactly. I'm sorry. There's just so many different distilleries at the moment. I'm in. I'm buying casks from. There's at least eight different places I I want to have casks from, and I'm going to have four by the end of the year. I hope, and maybe in two years I can be there with whenever you're finished, and I can do there as well as one of the founding members. So that'd be I'll, very I'll, very nice. I'll put you down as one of my follow-ups. <laughs> All right, very good. So Tina says, um, and it would be one of my last questions questions yeah. as well. Will we see each other, uh, Corona willing, um, by Whiskey Live in Dublin this year? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, and we'll have some, like last year, we'll have some interesting things that we've been experimenting with to, to get people's reaction to. All right, very good. And um, Thomas Gockel is here. Talk a little bit about these two things. So, well, Shanaki we've talked about, and you can see actually Shanaki there, the last word, there's an A in the middle that's, that's invisible. So that's the wonder <laughs> of Irish for you. Our Muncha is the first word, that's our people. And so that's a a scheme where it's a reward scheme rather than a cask scheme. So it's a, a 900 euro, 990 euros, and you get the first of everything we make over the next 10 years. Um, oh. so, so Thomas was one of our very first um, Armunches, and he, so as, as we come up with Dark Silky or Santa Ana or whatever, you get ones from the first batch uh, to taste those. So they get sent to you for that first 10 year period. Also very, very interesting. That's true. All right, good, good. We've also got, uh, I should have mentioned, Jason, but your name, if you're part of Shanaki or Muncha or even a shareholder, the names go around the base of the still, so they're there for posterity. So. Oh, okay. Very, very good. So that's also a little bit of an incentive to be part of, the, uh, part of the system before it starts. That's a good, good idea. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Well, well actually, uh, and the Shanaki one, <laughs> so I suppose it's just a little bit of fun, but if you buy the Shanaki cask, you get sent a, a milking stool, um, I thought I had one here. It's been moved, bugger. Um, but I, we have a milking stool which has the same details that's on the cask head written on it. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. um, so you get that to, to put in your house. So you, people can say, you know, people will say to you, what is that? And you get to sit on the stool and tell your story. Okay, very, very good. Yeah. So, okay, I can show you the picture here as well. Wait a sec, one second here. Um, do, do, do. There we are. So over in the right-hand corner, we can actually see the, the, the little stool That's here, it. yeah? Yeah, so okay. they're the milking stools, yeah. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Okay, good, good. Interesting scheme. Was that your idea or your wife's idea? Um, well, I suppose it, most of these things are kind of joint ideas. So, you know, they, they start off um, and, uh, you know, kind of kicking around how do you make people, how do, how do you give some, if you're going to buy a barrel, you don't get, you don't get anything physical to show off. A little piece of paper is what I have at the moment. So it's yeah. a certificate. Yay. But six, actually, 6,000 euros for a little tiny sheet of <laughs> Dina 4 paper. Yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you get to tell that? So we, I suppose one of the, one of the motivations is people want to tell their story. So yeah. Figured it would give you give you something you can actually people would say what is that you get to explain it and that's you telling your story so um, you know so it's yeah I don't know hopefully it hopefully it kind of tickles people all right very very good all Ooh. right thank you very much I look forward to seeing you in Dublin I look forward to seeing you one day also in Ireland there at your own home station there you're, and um, you're very welcome and the last thing if anyone wants more information just go to the website here. Um, Kevin says, enjoyed listening. Tina said, great to see you again. And I put up the website here. Um, because Good, I put up the www part as well. <laughs> and then um, people can actually find out more information and go online and sign up. You have a newsletter as well, I think. We have a, a blog, actually, so um, mm -hmm. which uh, I kind of tend to do in fits and starts. It tends to be about, uh, it's not so much about the technical stuff that's going on, but how I feel at the time. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a kind of bunch of random thoughts by a crate. <laughs> very good. You can follow you also on Instagram, on Facebook, and Twitter. Yep. Normal stuff, and that's very, very good. Also, Kate says regards from Wicklow. All, all right. right. Okay. All, all the best here. Whiskey Jason together with? James Doherty, Sleeve League Distillers. All the best. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Oops.